I hijacked Anna Kekalice in the car, in the taxi to the airport. Actually, hijacking is not the real word, is it, Anna? Three exciting days in Prague. Just only three left. I'm talking with Iracha Gomez. You're replacing Tony O'Brien within INA. Mm -hmm. Congratulations with your new position. Thank you. Now, Iracha, you had a presentation on drones, which is a very hot topic at the moment mm -hmm. in the world of critical communications and especially the search and rescue. Mm -hmm. Usage of drones and legislation, that's a hard topic. It is. Because when I fly a drone here in Prague, I'm not allowed to fly in no-fly zones, not, about, uh, not above the castle of the president. How are you going to manage that all? Well, we are looking into the legislation that's been uh, developed nowadays in Europe and, and in other countries. And we see that the harmonization of legislation won't be coming before 2018. The European community needs to set up the, the common rules, but that each country needs to, to, to apply them specifically, and then things may change from one country to another. But as long as they have provisions for the usage of drones in search and rescue operations or by fire brigades or by police uh, organizations, then it would be good. Uh, so national legislations then also need to transform that and, and the usage of drones can be regulated in that sense. Okay, but that's going to take a while, mm. right? And that's uh, unfortunate, but that is just the case as it is today. It is. You created a heat map, mm -hmm. and a heat map means a map where you can see the drones being used on several locations. I saw a lot of uh, activity in the UK. Is there mm -hmm. a special reason for that? Uh, probably because more and more organizations are actually testing the usage of drones in mass casualty incident investigation, uh, in search and rescue operations, in fire and, and rescue services and so on. And the usage of drones is being extended uh, uh, as, as emergency services see other emergency services using drones, they, they get them views and, and kind of Sorry. kind of try to do something more and something similar so uh, yeah and in some countries also the legislation is is a bit more advanced than in others so that's they, that may be the reason why the UK has so much usage of drones compared to other countries as I said the map is the heat map is public information only many in many occasions the information is not publicly available due to privacy reasons and, and sensitive information by police forces and so on so it's just a sample of, of the drone usage. Okay, so it's, these are not all situations oh, no, where they are. Not. They, there are more, many there more. There are many more, of course. If I buy a drone, mm -hmm. uh, like a Phantom 4, that costs me about 1,400 euros. Mm. Um, these are very inexpensive drones used by everybody in the public. Mm -hmm. I noticed that within those trials you also used those kind of drones. Will they be, su be sufficient to use them in emergency and rescue situations? Well, commercial drones nowadays being used and tested by emergency services uh, are sufficient with this, the right components like FLIR cameras or, or other components. And FLIR cameras are cameras detecting the heat, right, yes. from, from above, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need to have modular solutions and the commercial, uh, commercial drones provide that, that capability to add on uh, based on the needs of, of your uh, service. And uh, this component-based uh, usage is something that it's been looked at in the pilots uh, that we did with, with different uh, stakeholders. Okay, but the, the quality, the body of the drone, that's tough enough? Well, from what we saw, you know, maybe not the mini drones, uh, but the bigger, a bit bigger drones uh, that we tested, 
Uh, we're sufficient enough, uh, okay. provided the right amount of flight time, which could be better if it was longer, yeah. uh, the right amount of resistance to, to weather conditions, although we saw that it needs to be more resistant to wind and rain and, and yeah. overall severe weather. Yeah. But 4 but four, by 4 is the maximum wind force that you can fly. Uh, above 4, it's going to be tricky with the drone, yeah, is it? Of course. <laughs> yes. So in these considerations based on, on the usage of the drones, maybe in floods and, and, and severe weather situations and things like that, need to be taken into account. Yeah, so you cannot use always the drone no. in the search and rescue. No, no, so it's a good, good way to help the control room manager to understand the situation in the field. Uh, you're looking also to have live video streaming from the drone mm -hmm. into the control room because that's what we're talking about, control rooms here. Mm -hmm. um, is that already, is that technology already available or not? Uh, as far as I know, it's been tested. Uh, so it will be available in, in a me short, medium time, depending on, on the tests that are, are made. One of the biggest usage of drones by emergency response organizations is also at night time. So yeah. nighttime uh, usage that maybe in some countries they are not allowed to be flown uh, at yeah. night. Uh, it requires other other uh, aspects like signalization and, and recognition of the drone as an emergency yeah. drone and things like that. In 2017, there will be a test, another another trial. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more what's going to happen during that trial? Yes, in the in the new pilot project, we will be running with a vendor, uh, 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 emergency response organization, and also some of the partners. Mm -hmm. We will be focusing in one uh, pilot uh, site in, in a European country, but with capabilities maybe to work with other countries in the, in the bordering areas, uh, to test mostly real-time data communication with the, the PISA, with the control room, and how this real-time communication can be achieved using 3G, 4G and satellite networks. That would be the objective. Looking forward to the results. Thank you very much. Exactly what, what has been said is for me the solution for the future. We have three days of intensive training and understanding the control room environment from public safety to transport to other organizations, even the industry. Bravo was here and they tried to understand how they should implement the control room of the future for their network. They're an operator in Saudi Arabia for Tetra, they're doing some LTE as well. So, what kind of service can they provide to their customers? Birmingham Airport was here with a presentation. The airport is growing dramatically. It's so fast that they need to cope with that growth. So, how will their control room of the future will be? One of the most eye-catching presentations was London Ambulance. Why is it necessary to respond and to take every call serious? Well, they gave a good insight. Somebody could call for just cold feet. But if those cold feet are related to a disease, and that disease is life-threatening, that's a different call then. So try to understand exactly where the call is coming from, from who, what is the background, and what is happening if they don't show up. I'm here at Insta DevSec, and they have this magic cube, Rubik's Cube. And in the Rubik's Cube, you should have one side totally the same. But these guys have done something different with it because it's always 100% correct. Doesn't matter how you change this, it's 100% correct. So that's also with your product, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's better for the eyes. That is Hannes Larsen. Um, Hannes, one thing that struck me actually um, the design of the control room that you have in mind. You guys are working with black and grey colors. Yep. Uh, there must be a reason for that because a lot of other designs are based on white and, and, and really bright colors. Yeah. Why did you design that totally differently than a lot of other manufacturers? We tried it out on different kinds of operators and they 
really like the idea of a darker, uh, darker uh, layout because it it makes them uh, much more calmer in the uh, control room. They don't have the bright display uh, eight, ten hours a day, but they have a darker display in front of them, uh, which will make the eyes much more calmer. Uh, and what we also noticed is that they reacted quicker to colors. So the human factor and the technology combined together makes a great control room. Don't forget the people behind the scenes. So we did have a good time, didn't we? We did have a good time. We did have a very good time. So are you happy with the, about the turn up of the event? Yeah, really good. Like we've grown in every way. We've got more accepted sponsors, more attendees with smiling faces. Wow. At the end of the day we had around so like the room which actually the end of day one, uh, day two of this event is brilliant. And so. only two, uh, two people left who didn't show up? Actually, just one. Oh, only one? Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, there's almost no room for improvement, is it? There's always room for improvement. Thanks a lot. Have right, a good time. Later. See you, bye. Um, How many minutes will it take to go to the airport? Um, 15 minutes. Um, the traffic is fine, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I hijacked Anna Kekalice in the car, in the taxi to the airport. Actually, hijacking is not the real word, is it, Anna? No. So, um, and Anna is responsible for the business development at 112 Georgia. And one of the things they have implemented is the control room manager or control room person of the future. How do you call it? In, in uh, future is call takers 112. Future is call takers 112. Now that's kind of interesting because I've never seen that before. So Anna, what, what does that exactly mean? You 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 educate the youngsters on future call taking? Yes, we would like to deliver information to children in order to let them be aware of a uh, single, single emergency number 112. So we have created some futurist 112 call takers. So it's like a really effective project while communicating with the children. So they like it very much. Okay, and, and do you think that will also help to minimize the false calls uh, in, in, in the next 10 years? Yes, of course. We think that they will dial 112 in case of real emergencies. So they will be aware in which cases they need to dial this single emergency number and how to cooperate with the call takers in case of emergencies. And I've seen some crazy pictures of the youngsters uh, really in futuristic clothes and they're doing a very good promotion there. So I think that is a very good example for many other countries around the world to educate the youngsters on, on call taking and on what are the responsibilities. Great stuff. With that, I close the vlog.